loves traffic? Show of hands. Who loves to be stuck in soul-draining, bone-crushing, time-wasting traffic every morning, every afternoon? Come on, come on. Some of you must. Well, I have good news and bad news. The uh, bad news is that this is what our world is coming to. No matter where you go in the world, we are stuck in traffic that drains our resources, time, energy, forces us to spend innumerable hours in our car with virtually nothing else to do, and causes us to get frustrated and angry. And the dirty secret is that all vehicles, all surface vehicles, are stuck in this mess. Doesn't matter what kind of vehicle you're driving, if you're on surface traffic, you're going to be part of this, and that's going to lead to a tremendous waste of time. And this is getting worse. It's getting worse because we're adding more cars to the road with the growth of population, and it's getting much, much worse in Asia, where the first purchase of the emerging middle class is a car. And so while birth rates are going down in Asia, car ownership is going up. And so we're facing the true bottleneck, where we're having more cars on the road than it's going to ever be possible. And I know that in Paris, this is a problem, but I tell you, this is just as large a problem as any major city anywhere in the world. And of course, all of this congestion leads to pollution, and we apparently are crossing some important benchmark in global warming with parts of CO2 per million going through the roof. And cars and automobiles add about one-third of all greenhouse gas emissions. So what is the solution to this? Well, there is always the favored solution of those large infrastructure groups to build more roads. And so our cities are starting to look like these massive spaghetti bowls. But in fact, every study, whether from London School of Economics, MIT, the Population Energy Research Council, every organization that studied this worldwide has shown indisputably that vehicles, kilometers traveled, rises in direct proportion to what's called available lanes of kilometer roadway. In short, this is a very fancy way to say the more roads you build, the more traffic you're going to get. And I think anyone in any urban environment has experienced this, where suddenly there's another lane or another road and everyone's all happy, but within a year or two, it gets more congested. Psychologists and urbanologists explain this as anticipation, and so people go out and buy more cars or bring more cars or drive more, um, and of course, very quickly, this all gets congested, so we all know and are familiar with these beautiful landscapes that very quickly get filled up with these spaghetti roads. So the next question is, okay, what are the realistic alternatives to building more roads? And now we come to all of these transportation alternatives, and the bullet train is a very um, attractive solution because it goes very fast, but the problems with bullet trains is that it's not an urban-suburban solution. Urban bullet trains uh, make sense when you're crossing between large distances and you need to go fast and you don't have a lot of stops along the way because the reality is that a bullet train or a maglev train, no matter how fast it's going, goes zero kilometers an hour when it's stopped at a station. And so because these trains are so expensive, the operators want to have a lot of stations to get a lot of passengers to justify the cost. The problem is the more stations you add, the slower that train goes. Um, these things are, of course, also very expensive. We know in California now where there's a bullet train initiative going on and possible planning that the costs are already going through the roof several times over and they have not yet laid even one track. The uh, electric car, very cool. Everyone loves it. It's quiet. The problem is it's surface traffic. It's stuck in traffic just like all the other cars. And the unfortunate part of the electric car phenomenon is that the batteries are just not yet up to snuff, and so you're always fighting that concern about getting home without getting stuck with a drained battery. 
And the uh, issue is not a small issue because now you're starting to think, well, should I turn off the radio? Should I turn off the air conditioner to conserve my battery? Um, and the most important thing, as noted earlier, is that the electric cars are stuck in traffic with everyone else. They're adding to traffic. Light rail is a good urban solution, no question about it. The problem is it's very disruptive to the urban environment. San Jose, we're based, my company is based in Silicon Valley. San Jose um, has light rail. It goes through Silicon Valley. And it has literally cut the valley in two, where there are fences surrounding this light rail. And so you can't cross the street to go to the supermarket or go to get a cappuccino as you used to. You now have to circumvent the train. And um, of course, they follow a rigid schedule. And they're rather expensive. They run between 70 to $100 million a kilometer. The uh, computerized car, lots of talk of computerized car, lots of talk also about the traffic accidents that computerized cars are getting into. I won't address the traffic accidents because sooner or later they're going to get over that problem. But the real issue with computerized cars is that it's surface traffic. And so the computerized car is stuck in traffic with everyone else. And so even though it's very cool that your car can drive itself or at least alert you to hazards on the road, um, you're going to be stuck in the surface traffic. And what happens with computerized solutions is that they are very good at talking to other computers. They're not that good about talking to humans. And so when you have a mix of computers talking to human driving cars, you have a computerized car and then a human-driven car, we're not going to get to that accident-free environment. And if you have one computerized car on one operating system talking to another computerized car on another operating system, well, anyone who's tried to move a file from Mac to PC knows that this is not a smooth transition. So in the near term, I don't think that's really going to provide a solution. And even with that solution, it will not address congestion. Shared cars are all the rage, and they make a lot of sense for folks who don't want to own a car, and of course the millennials don't want to own cars. But actually, shared cars are on the road. They're on surface traffic more time than private cars. And this, of course, makes total sense. Why? Because when you drive your car to work, you leave your car there, it stands for eight or nine hours, and then you drive it home. But a shared car is actually on the road all the time because you drive it, you leave it, someone else gets into it, drives it again. So while it alleviates parking spot congestion, it does nothing for road congestion, it actually makes it worse. Subways and metros are fabulous. No one can argue with that. The problem with subways and metros is that they're very expensive to build, and they take a very long time to build. So for the New Yorkers among you, I know Mayor Bloomberg was just here, um, the last mile of subway in New York City, and I'm a New Yorker, um, took over a decade to build, over 10 years to build, and cost $2 billion. That's not $2 million, that's $2 billion for one mile. It's in the New York Times, you can check it out. And so it is unrealistic to expect cities today to go out and build these subway systems unless they can print their own money and uh, do so without concern for its valuation. And the Chinese are the only country to be able to do that. So then we come to what's called personal rapid transportation systems, or PRT. PRT are those systems that typically go above traffic, and so they're not stuck in surface traffic, and deliver you from where you are to where you want to go. PRT has been out there for over a decade. It has not been adopted by any city or any governmental region. The reason typically is that they're very slow and expensive and require a lot of infrastructure. Ultra is one of those companies. Ultra is backed by the British government. They've been around for nearly 10 years. They have one system working. It's at Heathrow Terminal 5 Airport. And um, it is basically a computerized golf cart. There's another company, Korean company, called Vectus. They built a demo in Sweden. It's steel on steel. And it also is very slow because it is um, using traditional mechanical byways. And the infrastructure is also relatively expensive to what it can do. And then there's a company called Together. It's a Dutch company. They've had somewhat more success, although it is also 
basically a computerized golf cart. They've actually rolled out a commercial system in Mazdar and the United Arab Emirates. It's underground, but there are not that many cities where you can build an underground infrastructure to accommodate these types of vehicles. Again, basically computerized golf carts. What's the importance of this computerized golf cart notion? The importance is speed. If the maximum speed of these systems is around 30 miles an hour, which it is, around 40 kilometers an hour, it can never connect Heathrow to London. It's okay within Heathrow, but it's not a realistic solution to get to the urban environment. So our system, or what we think a 21st century system needs to be, is a fast system, an inexpensive system, one that goes point to point, totally computerized, and rides above traffic. And that is uh, Skytran. And what you're looking at here is a real vehicle uh, on a track. It's based at the NASA Ames Research Center in California, in Mountain View, California, Silicon Valley. And uh, Skytran has some unique features that we believe will enable it to eventually capture a large segment of the population. Skytran is what's called a NASA Space Act company, meaning we have a uh, business alliance with NASA whereby we can tap into NASA expertise, uh, get their engineering support, um, wind tunnels, supercomputers, and the like, and we're based at the NASA Ames Research Center, and we're working with Israel Aerospace Industries in Tel Aviv to build a full-scale model of this system, and that's in progress now. So um, what does it look like? Well, you see it's a very small footprint. It has what we call a guideway, an elevated guideway, and off-ramps. And the vehicle travels above the traffic on the elevated guideway, and as such is never stuck in traffic. It also allows you to call a system just by touching your Skytran icon on your smartphone. So as soon as you touch it, the system recognizes you. It knows who you are from your number. It knows where you are from your GPS. And it will prompt you, asking you if you want it, a vehicle to a certain station at a certain time. If you confirm, you'll get a barcode. The vehicle will come to your station. It will not open to anyone else unless you present your barcode to the vehicle. But more importantly, the system runs on what's called a neural network. And so what that means is that our software program is a sophisticated learning software program. So within weeks of operation, it knows where vehicles are needed, at what time of day they're needed, and where they typically go. So it automatically calculates where to send vehicles, how long to wait at the station, where they're going to go, and how to best utilize and maximize the vehicles. If you bear in mind that a traditional bus or a train runs on a rigid schedule, that means that that bus or train is running empty most of the day, because during rush hour it's full, but during the day those trains and buses are pretty much running empty, and because you don't take off cars and you don't add cars, um, they're wasting a lot of energy, <clears throat> excuse me, and causing a lot of pollution. Skytrain really is only running when it has a person inside the vehicle. Um, we utilize uh, what we call dynamic motion, but in effect what that means is that no vehicle stops if the vehicle in front of it is, in, is stopped. So if the vehicle in front of you stops at a station, your vehicle simply uh, bypasses it because the vehicles that wish to stop go on an off-ramp, just like on a freeway or a highway. No one stops on the freeway or highway. You stop on an off-ramp. So you go to the off-ramp, you stop, and the other vehicles go by, so you're never stopped uh, because the person in front of you is stopping. Uh, it's also eventually going to be aesthetically pleasing. This is a San Francisco street that we can remove from all of its wires and hanging cables and put in the Skytran system. Um, it's very low cost. I'm not going to go into uh, details at the moment, but if you compare it to any other mode of transportation, we're a small fragment of that. And the, what this enables is private funding of Skytran. And so, to date, all public transportation systems lose money because infrastructure costs are so great, so the government has to buy it. With Skytran, it can be privately financed because the infrastructure cost is very low, the operational cost is very low because there are no drivers, no ticket takers, no uh, conductors. And so, we actually are generating, we'll be able to generate profit, pay back debt, and deliver systems that don't cost the taxpayer any money. 
Um, of course, we created this comparison, so you will find, not to your surprise, that we actually are better than everyone else. And um, my colleague, here, how does uh, that work? we're based at the NASA Ames Research Center. What he's showing you is he's holding a magnet in his hand. Magnets are invisible force that attract other magnets, uh, attracts other magnets, and they attract iron. He's pointing to the top sheet, which is plastic. There's no iron in plastic, and the bottom sheet is aluminum. There is no iron in aluminum. So he's going to drop the magnet, and you'll see what happens from the plastic to the aluminum. Okay, we get it. Drop it. <laughs> there we go. So he drops it, and it just falls straight down. Why? Because of gravity. He's going to do it again, drops the magnet, it falls straight down. Now, what's cool about aluminum is although it doesn't have any iron and it's not magnetic, it does conduct electricity because it has something that physicists call loose electrons. And those loose electrons conduct electricity, but on magnets, they also act sometimes like heavy molasses. And you see? The magnet comes to almost a full stop simply by changing the orientation of the magnet. We're going to show it to you again. From the plastic to the aluminum, boom, complete stop. Now, anyone who's been on a roller coaster has experienced this because this is how roller coasters stop. You can go very fast and then boom, you come to an almost immediate stop. Why? Because of this molasses effect. So what did our engineers do? They thought, well, if we can change the orientation of these magnets and put two magnets together, we can fly. And that's what you're seeing here. This is the magic of magnetic flight. This is just like a glider glides on air. Our wings, we call these our magnetic wings, glide along this aluminum. And they're doing it on a magnetic wave that they themselves are actually generating. So no power is required. Now look what happens. We put a SkyTran vehicle on our magnetic wings. And all we have to do is push this vehicle forward or pull it forward and you're going to see what happens. Bingo, flight. And understand that this flight is free. We're not spending any energy to get the flight. And what does the flight get us? Zero friction. And what happens when you remove friction from transportation? Your energy uses drops, drops precipitously. So all we do is we take all of this stuff and we give it a little push. If any of you have played air hockey or ice hockey, you know what happens when you give that puck a little push? Boom, it'll go forever. That's how SkyTran is efficient, cost effective, and really the game changer. So how do we get that um, little push we talked about? Actually, first what I'm going to do is show you our magnetic wing. This is uh, full size, the, that black portion. That's the magnetic wing, which you saw previously on the aluminum board. And how do we get the propulsion? Well, we've taken a rotary motor, a simple motor. We've wrapped it with neodymium magnet. And when the motor rotates, the magnet wants to go forward. When it rotates the other direction, it wants to go backward. This is basic physics. The beauty of this is that when you put it in an aluminum cylinder, it all floats okay. inside April the 5th, cylinder. 20 foot uh, bogey test, number three. Go ahead, Robert, let it roll. <laughs> Okay. Excellent. Bye-bye. <laughs> so what you see inside there is the motor wrapped with a magnet, and it's floating inside that aluminum cylinder. It's going at a very high speed. This is 40% to scale. At full scale, this thing is impossible to stop unless it uses its unique braking system. So um, very powerful motion, zero friction. And all of this creates tremendous propulsion that we use to get levitation. Where does it all go? It all goes within our guideway. And the beauty of it is that if you turn our guideway upside down, you um, basically get the same thing. It works just the same. The physics doesn't care what direction it's in. And so it can ride or it can fly. And that's why SkyTran is really the best system in its class, whether it's a riding system or a hanging system. And my time is out, and so I thank you very much. Bye-bye. Um,